Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Ajax Public Library's Brain Health presentation presented by the Alzheimer's Society of Durham Region. My name is Julia Campbell, and I'm the Adult Services Librarian at the Ajax Library. I just wanted to start by quickly covering a couple of things on Zoom, just in case there's anybody that's new to using it. Today's presentation is being recorded, so I would ask that you please keep your webcam and microphones off so that you are not displayed or heard in the recording. The camera and microphone icons can be found at the bottom left of your screen. We will have a Q&A portion after the presentation, at which point I will stop the recording to protect everyone's privacy and so that everyone feels comfortable to ask questions. At that point, please feel free to unmute yourself and turn your camera back on if you wish to do so. In the top right of your screen, you can choose the view you prefer. The speaker view will allow you to see the speaker beside the presentation, and the gallery view will allow you to see all the participants in the program. So I leave it to you to decide which view you prefer. The chat button is along the bottom. If you have any questions or comments you would like to share along the way, and you have the option of chatting with the entire group, or you can send a private message to me, Julia, or Amy, our presenter. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation, and we will do our best to get to them either during the presentation or at the end. If you would prefer not to see the chat along the side, you can click the chat button at the bottom again, and it will disappear. And for phone participants, you can press star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute yourself. And just to test out the chat function, if you feel comfortable sharing where you heard about today's program, please type it out in the chat. If you experience any technical difficulties today, I recommend that you exit the program and re-enter. And if you continue to have difficulties, please place a comment in the chat and I will do my best to assist you. Phone participants, you can press star nine if you require assistance. I think that covers the basics for Zoom, um, but if anything else comes up along the way, please use the chat function to get in touch with us. So now I would like to introduce our presenter for today, Amy Stevenson, a public education coordinator with the Alzheimer's Society of Durham Region. Amy has been volunteering and working with seniors for the past six years. Prior to her work with the Alzheimer's Society, she completed her master's in aging and health at Queen's University and has a bachelor's in kinesiology from Western University. When she's not working, Amy likes to spend time outside, hiking, running, or paddling. We feel very lucky to have her with us today. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Amy. Thank you, Julia, so much for that lovely introduction. And I just wanna thank everyone who's in attendance today. I know we all have very busy schedules and so I appreciate you spending some time today to consider your brain health. As mentioned sort of at the onset, I do believe this is a topic that is important to everyone. And so hopefully we can all learn a thing or two today. So hopefully now everyone will see me as a giant floating head um, and we'll be able to move forward with today's presentation. During today's presentation, I will give us an idea of what is dementia both Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia, as well as addressing what are the risk factors to one's risk of developing dementia. We'll also cover ways that you can help to reduce your risk of developing dementia by almost 40%. So hopefully by the end of today, we have one or two takeaways to move forward with to have a healthier brain. And so why should we care? As I mentioned, I, we all have brains. And so I feel like this is pretty relevant to everyone. But understanding the impacts of dementia can bring up a little bit more awareness for all of us. So knowing that almost half a million Canadians are living with dementia, and that number is from 2016, so it has increased. It's projected to reach almost 1 million by 2031. And a little bit closer to home, in Durham region, there are almost 1,100 people living with dementia. One of the major risk factors for this is age with the risk of dementia doubling every five years after the age of 65. This is important as we understand that our population is aging and the number of people with dementia is going to increase with that aging. With approximately one in four individuals over the age of 85 having some form of dementia. And it's important to understand that dementia does not just impact the person with a diagnosis. We can all likely think of someone maybe in our lives that has been impacted by dementia, whether that's directly or maybe they're playing the role as a caregiver or they're playing the role of a neighbor or a friend to someone who's living with dementia. 
that import that impact and that circle of care around that person helps to spread that impact and really does make it important for everyone to be aware of. And so a little bit about the impact of dementia on the brain. With the most important note highlighting that dementia is not part of normal aging. So while we do expect some things to slow down a little bit as they age, whether that's your car or how quick you are to figure out the highest Scrabble score, we do know that dementia is not normal. It is caused by deteriorations in the brain. So on my left-hand side, could be on your right, um, I have the causes of dementia. This is important to note because oftentimes we might think of Alzheimer's disease as dementia, where in fact, Alzheimer's disease is just one of the causes of dementia. It is the most common form of dementia, but it's not the only form. This is important to note because it helps to highlight the fact that with many different causes, there are many different expressions of dementia. On the other side of your screen, you'll see some of the symptoms. And while we all think of memory loss, there's also challenges with judgment, changes in behavior, difficulty with executive function, and our capacity to perform with our daily activities. And I'd like to hear from you of, have you experienced dementia in your life, whether it was a friend, a neighbor, a loved one. Feel free to mention that in the chat. And so as we look at these causes, each one is caused by different pathologies in the brain. Once again, highlighting that with all those different causes, um, everyone will present with a different set of symptoms, meaning that if you've met one person with dementia, you've met one person with dementia. And that can start to sound a little bit concerning, thinking, okay, we know this is serious, we know this is important, and we know that this is something that has likely impacted a lot of us. And thank you for those who have uh, mentioned in the chat, because it is something that a lot of us experience. And so then, this is probably what a lot of you are hoping for today, is what are the risk factors for dementia, and how can I reduce those risk factors to promote brain health? and to make sure that I'm as cognitively fit as possible. And so I am going to start with the non-modifiable factors. Was my hand. Um, and these ones are the ones that we can't control. And while we can't control them, it's important to be aware of them. Because it could be important to be able to tell our healthcare providers that we might be potentially predisposed. And the more we're aware of that, the more we can help to act proactively. So I can see in the chat that a couple of people have said that it might have been their mother or father. This is important to know because there are certain genetic factors that can increase one's risk of developing dementia. We know that having a family history can predispose someone, specifically with the early onset dementia, because there are certain gene variations that have been identified. And while it doesn't necessarily mean you will develop dementia, it could increase your risk and it's something to bring up to healthcare providers. And as I mentioned at the onset, we know that age is a big risk factor for dementia. And so as we get older, it's something that we might become more aware of in our social circles, something that might get discussed a little bit more and something that we really should take to heart. And unfortunately, we also know that women represent about 60% of those diagnosed. There are multiple reasons for this, and it is quite a big topic. If you're interested in learning more specifically about that, you can go to the Alzheimer's Society of Durham Region website, and you can go to our January Awareness Month, where we spent an entire month focusing on that topic, and we built up a resource bank to help explain those discrepancies. It's also important to note your family history of other conditions. Conditions like kidney disease and Parkinsonism are linked with a increased risk of developing dementia and are important to be aware of when discussing with your family care, your healthcare provider. 
And so those are all the things we can't control. So if you sat there thinking like, yep, 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 and start starting to feel a bit bad, um, don't worry. There are lots of these modifiable factors. These are the ones that we're really going to focus on today. And a lot of these factors, there's not a lot of trick tricks here. A lot of it is things that you've already been told. We know that risk factors for both Alzheimer's disease are often common risk factors for cardiovascular disease, such as high cholesterol levels in the blood, high blood pressure, diabetes, are all things that can increase one's risk. Likewise, there's common um, preventative measures like being physically active and maintaining a healthy body weight can be protective factors. We also know that smoking sensation can dramatically reduce one's risk. So these are a lot of the things we may have heard before. We also know that excessive alcohol intake, so more than about one or two drinks per day, Social isolation, air pollution cannot increase one's risk of developing dementia. One thing that we don't often think of is hearing loss. Untreated hearing loss can contribute to one's risk, risk of developing dementia. This is because very much like a muscle, our brain works where if we don't use it, we lose it. And so those who have hearing loss are more likely to be socially isolated as, and not as engaged. Your brain will also stop being stimulated by those frequencies that are lost due to the hearing loss. And so there will be synaptic pruning to those areas because they're not being engaged. So treating hearing loss and addressing some of these other risk factors in our life can help us to reduce our risk. And once again, reiterating that um, a recent Lancet Commission on Dementia Prevention, Intervention, and Care presented a life course model that showed 12 potential modifiable risk factors, many of which I've listed, account for about 40% of the worldwide dementias, meaning that you can have a serious impact on your risk of developing dementia. And so now we're going to work into some the top four tips that the Alzheimer's Society promotes towards protecting your brain and building up your brain cognitive reserve. And so the first one and my favorite one, as you heard during the intro, is being active. So we know that physical activity has immense benefits for pretty much everything. It helps our cardiovascular system. It improves our blood pressure. It improves our mood. And to no surprise, it also improves our cognitive health. We can think of the more we're able to get our blood pumping, the better there's going to be circulation to everywhere in our body, including our brain. And it can help to improve one's cognition, both in the immediate term, where you may feel more focused after doing some exercise, but it can also have long-term implications, part of which is helping to reduce those other risk factors that I mentioned in the slide before. And now, a lot of people ask me, what is the best physical activity that I should be doing to help my brain? And the answer is whatever you're going to keep doing. I can sit here and tell you to go run 10 miles and you will look at me probably dead in the eye and say no, because you probably don't want to do that. And, but there might be a few people in the crowd that are like, yeah, sign me up. So the best exercise really is the exercise that you enjoy most. The goal is to get your heart rate up. So if we are going to go walking, we want to try to make sure it's a brisk walk, maybe doing some hills, something that's going to get our heart rate up and get those cardiovascular improvements. But strength training and balance training is also important to work into one's um, routine. Does anyone have any physical activity habits that they like to participate in? If so, please share them in the chat. And right now, it can seem a little bit daunting of ways to get out and active. But as we mentioned, the sun is coming, <laughs> spring is coming, we can stay active. 
Um, and this could be by doing things inside when it's not the greatest out, or ideally making use of um, the environment that we have around us, going for runs, going for walks, going for bike rides when the weather permits, um, and also accessing different online activity courses. I know there is an abundance of online exercise classes that are available that are geared towards different levels of physical activity, so you can find something that works for your level. So we've got someone who's walking on the treadmill at least 10,000 steps every day. That is spot on. And so it's nice to have a bit of a motivation and find a routine that works for you. Really create a schedule or opportunities that you're going to engage with. So next up, we want to use our muscles and we also want to think of our brain once again as that muscle. So exercising our thinking. And one way to do that is we can do this by engaging in mental activities. So this can help to increase our synaptic connections in our brain, which will improve our cognitive reserve and act as a protective effect against dementia. So once again, that move it or use it, move it, that use it or use it or lose it concept comes into play, where the more we can engage our brain, the more we can do different things that stimulate in different ways, the more connections will be built and maintained. So once again here, it's going, the best activity for your brain is really going to be something that you can give your full attention to. So some people, they'll read, but they'll sort of be passing through the content where you're not really engaged in it. So the goal is to really do something that you can give your full attention to. So this often means something that is meaningful for you. And we also know that people who have purpose in their life tend to live are 2.5 times less likely to develop to dementia. Having that purpose and that motivation can help to increase one's engagement. And so once again, feel free to share in the chat, what are you doing to challenge your brain every day? It might be playing with different apps, doing some crossword Sudoku. There's even simple things like trying to use your opposite hand, doing the dishes or brushing your hair, trying to learn a new language with the hopes that one day we might be able to travel somewhere. And different games like chess or bridge or crosswords um, or any sort of multi-person game can be done online to help build in a social component. If no one in your household is as keen as you are to pick up a game of checkers. Jigsaw puzzles, yes. So thank you to whoever's also doing jigsaw puzzles and taking over their dining room tables. It's just a nice bit of color in the space. So we encourage everyone to keep up their hobbies and pursue different cultural activities, again, to find whatever is most meaningful to you. And when we can, trying to learn different things or shaking things up just that little bit away. And someone's learning, to, learning Spanish and learning to play the piano. Very nice. Another really important topic is food. We know that we fuel our bodies every day and we make choices related to the foods that we're eating. And this slide could be an entire presentation in itself. We know there's a lot of questions related to what is the best brain food. Um, and this will just be a quick synopsis, but there will be more information later and the opportunity to ask questions. So we do recommend that you follow Canada's new food guide. And what this food guide entails is that half of our plate is made of um, fruits and vegetables. We then have a quarter that is whole grains and a quarter that is protein sources. And so within that diet, there's a lot of variation, but it really does highlight eating fruits or vegetables at every meal and trying to have at least one dark green leafy vegetable. I like to think about it as eating the rainbow because that also makes my plate look more fun. But it really breaks down to trying to eat foods that are different colors. This is because the colors in that food represent the different types of micronutrients in it. So if we're eating various different colors, then that means that we're gonna be able to get in all of those different micronutrients. 
There has also been multiple studies supporting the Mediterranean diet towards promoting brain health. So if we think about the Mediterranean diet, that's once again going to highlight the different uses of fresh whole fruits and vegetables, as well as whole grains, and having high fat um, or foods rich in omega-3s um, like fish. So having that balanced diet is important. So that does mean that we might have some things in moderation. So my question is, how often should we be eating something like white bread? And you can think about it. You can answer in the chat if you'd like, or just answer for yourself. But we, I, and not to, to push down on anyone's choices, but something like that or other refined products, we do want to try to limit and sort of see that as a treat. Um, we have some people that are saying they're never going to have white bread. And I would agree with that. Um, whole wheat bread or whole grain breads do provide more nutrients. I think they taste better. Um, but there can be simple swaps like that, switching out white bread for something that's higher in fiber that can help to make a change in your diet. And because diet is such a big part of our lives, we don't want to do a complete 360. As motivated as we may feel, uh, making small changes means that we're much more likely to have a sustainable change. So swapping out some chips for an apple or incorporating more whole foods. We all are spending a little bit more time at home, so it could be a good opportunity to spend more time making meals. If you've jumped onto the bread making bandwagon, then you've had lots of <laughs> nice fresh homemade, homemade bread and all of a sudden white bread just doesn't seem like it's anything anymore. And so moving on from diet, um, an important, so important for our mental well-being and for our cognitive health is staying social. This is something that I think we have all understood is so important for our well-being in this past year because we realize that socializing has a protective effect on the brain and it can actually lessen your risk of developing dementia. So having those Zoom calls, calling up a friend, writing a letter, all of those are really important. Recognize that socializing helps us to engage with others, keeping us stimulated. It can also have a protective effect in the sense that we are less likely to feel stressed or isolated when we have those social connections. And again, it's a bit harder right now to have those connections, but we do know that we can work and try to make them happen. It might just be a little bit more creative ways. So having those porch visits or the drive-bys, or again, just calling up for a friend. If we needed any more motivation, there's your little bit of a tip and a reminder to say, I should call up so-and-so. I wonder how they're doing. Or as I mentioned before, doing some of those brain games, uh, but doing them online. So you can play Scrabble online or really any game online and you can connect with people that you know or make new friends. And so those are the big top four um, that, I'm, that I am gonna leave you with today. Now, a lot of those sound very familiar, um, or at least they should. It sounds a lot like what your mother may have told you when you were growing up. Um, eat your vegetables, get your exercise, be nice to people, and read a book. But there are variations of all of them to make sure that you're really going to engage with them. And yes, we have golfing is social and physical, and that is a win-win. If you can combine social with physical, that's even better. Um, assuming we can all stay socially distanced um, and abide by those, but I think golf is actually pretty good for that. Um, and the more we can stay, the more, as soon as we can really get outside, I know things are gonna open up a little bit more. And so those were our big four, but there are lots of other things we can do. And so I'm gonna talk about um, a little bit more of sort of how we can get into those other ones. So, we know that there's a lot of different things that are gonna impact our brain. 
And so these are, again, some things that you might be familiar with already, but I'm just going to reiterate them as things that really do impact our brain. So some of the first things are is to really listen to your body. Our bodies are pretty smart. Like we're a very complex system going on here. It gives us signals and feedbacks of how things are going. And so listening to those signals is important. So this could mean tracking your numbers, um, being aware of your blood pressure and your cholesterol levels and your blood sugar. And sometimes it can be fun to track these numbers and potentially watch them change as you get more physically active or you take um, healthy, healthier steps within your diet. It's also important to notice because then if your numbers aren't in range, you could be able to more easily identify that to healthcare providers and address them and being aware of when you should speak to your doctor. It also helps you to be aware if you have any medical conditions that could put you at a higher risk of developing dementia. We know that only about 25% of cases of, of dementia are diagnosed. And that's not a lot. So that means that 75% of people who are living with dementia go undiagnosed. So listening to those signs in our body is important. An undetected dementia puts the person at risk of getting lost, having a car accident, taking a medication error, or having potential financial difficulties. So the earlier we can address some of these warning signs, and the sooner we can get support, um, the better off we are. And so this could mean that you can advocate for a friend if you're noticing changes. But again, listening to your body, and that could be things like making sure we're getting enough sleep. We know that sleep is when our brain has the chance to recover and repair itself. And so if we're not getting adequate sleep, that can increase our risk. We also want to um, look at avoiding harmful habits. So as I mentioned, smoking really is up there on that list. Smoking exposes you to a wide range of diseases, including cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes. Um, and we know that individuals who are smokers have a 45% higher risk of developing dementia. So stopping smoking can be a real turning point for you. And there is a similar story related to alcohol. So we do encourage people to be aware of that, of consuming alcohol in moderation um, and recognizing that that can be a risk factor if done in excess. Some other points that we might not often think of as impacting our risk, but using, controlling our stress, recognizing that as people, it's pretty easy to get stressed. Again, the last year has been a trying time, um, but recognizing our stress levels can be important to help ensure that we aren't spiking our cholesterol. We aren't, we're not spiking our cortisol in our blood. We're not raising our blood pressure. We're using the different support, social supports around us. We're using the different networks because stress can both impact our sleep. It can lead us to making poor diet choices. And so being aware of our stress and trying to recognize our stressors and control them can be helpful for your overall well-being, which includes your brain health. And the last one here on this circle is using safety aids, which will mean different things to different people. For some people, using a safety aid might mean wearing a helmet when you ride your bike. It could also mean ensuring that you have a handrail on your staircase or that if you have been prescribed a walker, that you use it. We know that falls that can lead to concussions or traumatic brain injuries can significantly decrease one's cognitive reserve and increase your risk of developing dementia. And just as a note, because it happened to me yesterday, um, sometimes using safety aids is also using common sense. So to not go running when it's super icy out because you will fall and you will hurt yourself. Um, and I did that. So we all have lots to learn and sometimes we need reminders. But reducing our fall risk can help to improve our brain health by reducing our risk of having any damage that incurred through a fall. And so to the golfers who want to get the daily double, we love the idea of combining a lot of these brain healthy activities, whether that means cooking with a friend or sharing a recipe um, or physic being physically active with someone 
socializing, doing all those different activities. We also know that volunteering has a really great impact on your brain. It helps to increase your social connection through your neighborhood. It helps to increase your sense of meaning. Um, if you're interested in learning more about promoting a dementia-friendly community and volunteering with us at the Alzheimer's Society, you can learn more on our website. Also, if you go to our website, you can learn more about all the other things we do. Um, we do do a lot of things. So if this presentation is leading you to a lot of questions thinking, hmm, I am concerned about my brain health, I'm concerned about a loved one's brain health, or I would just like to learn more about this topic because I have some family history or some other risk factors, then we have an abundance of resources that can help to connect you with different supports and services. You don't need to have a diagnosis to access the Alzheimer's Society, and all of our services are free. So we provide information, educational support sessions for both persons with dementia, care partners, or other individuals with personal interest. We can provide counseling, um, both to families, individuals, and groups. We also have information related to the Finding Your Way and Safely Home program. So this is to support living well with dementia and living safely within your community. We also are connected with a, the Mint Memory Clinic, which is a comprehensive and multidisciplinary team that can help support someone through that diagnosis, diagnosis process. So there's a lot, there's a lot of things here. Um, and again, if any of these you have questions about, please feel free to ask me during the Q&A or you can contact me after this presentation. And so I've just given you all a lot of information. So if you're taking notes, hopefully we have a couple, a couple things jotted down. But here's sort of our summary that Alzheimer's disease is the most common, although not the only cause of dementia. But the dementia as a whole is life changing. And it's a condition that affects our brain function and our ability to manage our lives every day. We know that we can reduce our risk of developing dementia by upwards of 40% by focusing on the factors that we have discussed today. We can be motivated to help to promote our brain health for ourselves, but also understanding that a diagnosis of dementia will impact many around us. And so we can definitely protect our brain. If we have questions or if we have concerns, it's always best to speak to a healthcare provider to determine if there are steps that you can take to help to reduce your risk, or if there are potential causes um, in your life that you can address. There are reversible causes of dementia that can bring on different memory and cognition changes that can be treated. And so the sooner those can be addressed, the sooner one can return to a higher level of cognition. So the main goal is it's never too early or too late to start. And hopefully we've all thought of a couple different ways to help to promote our brain health. And this is something that is relevant and is something that is impacting. And so for all of you today, I hope that you can commit to personal action. So thinking about one or two of the things that I mentioned in today's presentation, and seeing if you can incorporate those into your day. And that could mean picking up a book, going for a walk, trying to swap out that white bread for something else, or really taking a closer look at where your health is at the moment and what are some of the risk factors in your life that are potentially putting you at a higher risk of developing dementia? What conversations do you need to have with maybe a friend, a family member, or your healthcare provider? And so if this is a topic that you would like to learn more about, we have an upcoming series. Um, it's our Support for Living Safely with Dementia series. It's running Thursday mornings from 10 a.m. until 11.30. Next Thursday, we have a presentation on the impacts of sleep and dementia. And the following Thursday, we have a presentation regarding enhancing and supporting independence. To learn more about that, you can click on the link that you currently can't click on, but um, I will provide that link in the chat bar. Once again, these sessions are free to attend. The sleep and dementia one is being facilitated by um, a nurse practitioner and a physician that focuses on a geriatric practice. 
And again, lots of opportunities. Will you do a program on food? We will be doing a program on food, um, not in the coming months, but that is to come. So Julia will be able to update you about that because we do know it's a big topic. And so before we get completely into our question and answer period, I do actually have a few questions for you all. And so I'm now going to challenge all of you with a little bit of an idea of how we can start to challenge our brain. And so this one, I will be asking lots of opinions in the chat bar. So to all of you, is this a bunny or a duck? Please feel free to commit your answer to the chat bar. Bunny or duck, duck or bunny? I'm seeing a duck, I'm seeing a both. And so is this something that we, what do we see first? And then how long do we have to look or where do we have to look to see the second? The answer is both. And so for anyone that's looking at it and seeing only one. So right now I would be kissing the bunny. And above me is the duck's bill. So we can see how, I mean, it's just sort of a silly thing, but at first glance, you might see one thing and then looking a little bit further, you may see something else. It's a small way to challenge your brain to see something in a different point of view. Next up, we have, what color is the word? Now, the good news is everyone is on mute. So I wanna ask everyone to try to read through all of these words and see what point you get stuck at. So the goal is to say the color of the word. So the first one is not green, but yellow, but not yellow, but green. I've made it one word and I've messed up, um, but give it a try for yourself and see how far you can get. If anyone makes it all the way through, please let me know in the chat bar. A couple of people saying they're done. Okay, we did it. And how, how many of us had to catch ourselves or take the moment of saying, okay, green, red, blue, yellow, blue, black, red, green, blue, brown, purple, red, green, blue, yellow, black, purple, brown. Okay, so for everyone who got through the full list, now do it again, but say the word, not the color. <laughs> and so it does take a second. And it's a funny thing to think that you can almost feel, it's those moments when you're like, I can feel the smoke coming out of my ears. Um, and sometimes those moments can be frustrating. They're good because it means that we're engaging our brain. We've got those neurons firing. We're thinking, we're engaged. So yeah, with some, we're making some mistakes. So the next one is, can you spot what's, what is wrong with this picture? <laughs> so if you are getting a headache, feel free to step back, look away from the computer. So again, um, as soon as you find out what's wrong with this picture, please let me know. All right, so we've got some eight, some upside down eights. Um, and well, that is definitely something to be said. Uh, I see a couple other people that have spied the other one. And this is the one that not everyone will see. Can you spot the, the mistake? It's amazing how quickly our brain will erase something or fill something in. But when we can engage and spend a little bit more time thinking, we can spot these things and, again, just start to use our brain in some nuanced ways. All 
Got another one. How many legs does the elephant have? So when you have an answer, I want you to type in your answer into the chat, but also consider typing in the strategy that you use to count the legs. I like the pause. I feel like it's everyone thinking. Since when do elephants have five legs? So are we counting the toes? Are we counting the spaces? So we've got a strategy of see all the legs and then count them out. And it's your computer screen. So if anyone's going like this on their computer screen, that's also a strategy. And there really is no right answer to this one. But again, it's one of those things where it makes you think. And this is to say that not all of those moments to make us think have to be some deep intellectual TED talk, but letting ourselves engage in fun thinking activities. or all legs don't have toes. All right, I've got one more, see how this one goes. Looking at this picture, what do you see? An older woman or a younger woman? So again, we've got that, that churning, that thinking. So we've got some young, young first, then maybe an older woman. We've got some both. All right, so a lot of people that are, pardon me, sorry, a lot of people that are seeing both, and that's awesome. And so it's one of those things that, again, we can think about different things. And for those of you that aren't seeing both, and you're sort of staring at this picture, if this was a young woman, she is looking out over her shoulder, and she'd be looking off into the distance where she's got a big fluffy coat, and this red line here is her necklace. If this was an older woman, this red line here is her mouth, that is her nose, and the ear of the young woman is the eye of the older woman. And so again, just the idea of thinking how we can look at things with a different perspective and how we can apply this thought to both looking through random word puzzles or picture puzzles, or how we can approach our daily routines and look at it in a different way to stay engaged or to try something new. And so my question for all of you is, are we ready to help keep our brains healthy? And I can't hear you guys because we're all on mute, but I really hope that we're saying it nice and loud. Yes, um, because you can. And we've shown that there are lots of ways to significantly reduce. Thank you for the yes in the chat bar. Uh, there are significantly, significant ways to help to reduce our risk and keep our brain healthy. I've mentioned the word cognitive reserve a couple times during this presentation. And I want to address it because it's not something that we often hear, but it's the way of thinking that if we can build up our brain the same way we build up a muscle, then we can build up our cognitive reserve. So this is things like getting a good education, staying, all the things that we've said to stay socially connected. And what that means is kind of like having a complex or really good roadway system where if a road gets blocked, that's okay because you have other side roads. So if I'm driving to work and the 401 has a shutdown, then I might have some troubles getting to work. 
assuming I was going into the office. But if I knew the side roads really well, then I wouldn't be so thrown off by that. I'm like, okay, well, I can just get off here and take these side roads. It's similar where the higher cognitive reserve we have, it's like we have a more expansive map. So if there is any sort of um, cognitive degeneration that we do see with age um, or because of a dementia, that we're not going to be as impacted. So we might have some of the development of dementia, but we might not be presenting with the symptoms because we have side roots. And so this is the idea of the healthier we can keep our brain, the higher we can keep our cognitive reserve, the better off we are for our, both our overall well-being, because all of those factors really do help us all. Um, and the more we can improve our brain health and our likelihood of staying cognitively fit. I like all the yeses. I like the capital yes. And so if you spent this entire presentation thinking, yes, this is great information, it would be so much better if it was in French, we do that. Um, so if you are Francophone or would prefer having services in French or know anyone who would prefer having services in French, please follow up with the Alzheimer's Society as we can provide that. We also have, as I mentioned, an abundance of educational opportunities. Um, we are very fortunate to have a trained psychotherapist as part of the Enhancing Care for Ontario Care Partner Program. This is an evident evidence-based program developed by the Reitman Center and Sinai Health Systems um, and is very um, well-developed, well-researched, and provides really engaging sessions um, for care partners to help to develop their skills as a care partner um, and to improve the quality of care they can provide for others. So we have a TEACH program, which is four weeks, our CARES program, which is eight weeks, and a mindfulness session, which is an eight-week program. For more on these, we do recommend that you go to our website to learn more and to um, get into contact with the facilitator. And so once again, I want to thank everyone for their participation today and engaging with our content. We really think it's important for everyone to learn and be aware of these concepts. And we think that it helps to improve our mission to improve the lives of those living with dementia and their care partners by spreading awareness. If you know anyone that would benefit from our services, please do help to support us by letting them know about our resources. You, if you are able to, you can make a financial donation so that we can continue on our mission or just help spread the word. And so with that, I want to say thank you. And I want um, once again to reiterate that um, the recording you can ask Julie, but, but I would like to now open the floor for our Q&A period because I know there was a lot of content there and I imagine, and, and I am imagining there's quite a few questions.